Good morning. As we continue our study in the daily word, we come to the last half of Matthew chapter 9. And this is again, Jesus, Matthew is showing us that Jesus has given us forensic evidence that he is the promised Messiah. And he's doing it by basically miracles and these miracles of healing. Well, we come to uh, chapter 9, verse 18, to the end of the chapter, and now we're going to see the most remarkable power of Jesus Christ, and that is the power over death. So what happens is it begins with this official from the local synagogue in Capernaum. So we pick it up in chapter 9 of Matthew, verse 18. While he was saying these things, Jesus uh, was speaking and teaching. He says, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus got up and began to follow, and so did his disciples. Now what's interesting, the synagogue official, and it means that he's one of the elders of the local synagogue, well, the synagogue there in Capernaum, and because of the title used here in the original Greek, he was probably the highest ranking official. And, and whatever thoughts he had about the reaction of his fellow religious leaders, he knew that Jesus was the only one who could heal his daughter. Now, Mark and Luke gives us the same account, but adds a little bit of input, like the man's name. His name was Jairus. And Jairus, basically, when he was approaching Jesus, the daughter apparently wasn't dead yet. But as he was approaching, before he talked to Jesus, we're told that she died. And that's why he goes, and when he finally gets the chance to talk to Jesus, she had already died. And we're also told, in the other accounts, she was 12 years old. That would be the very beginning of womanhood. You see, in the Jewish custom, it was the age 13 for a male. That's when he was bar mitzvah, became a son of the law, uh, was considered a man. But for a woman, she was ba mitzvah, considered a woman at the age of 12. And so her sickness, her death caused by that, that going through that beginning of womanhood, we were not sure. But he believed that only he, they needed the touch of Jesus would raise his daughter, now here it is, from the dead. You know, you get this idea that Jesus did not mind interruptions. Well, take note of that when you think you're busy. Jesus did not mind interruptions uh, to what he was about to do because he saw them as opportunities that God would use him. And so he always saw a need, the need of the multitudes, but here he also hears the cry of one. So Jesus noticed as he's on his way, something else happens. And so you notice in verse um, 20, and a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage, bleeding for 12 years, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his coat. For she was saying to herself, if I only touched his garment, I will get well. But Jesus turning and seeing her said, daughter, take courage, your faith has made you well. And at once, notice these all happen immediately, at once the woman was made well. So here what you have is Jesus is actually on the way to heal or to raise this little girl from the dead. And on his way, he encounters this other woman. Again, another interruption, but really she encounters him. And this bleeding, possibly some tumor, some disease, but the problem is that, in again, the Jewish custom of the day, this would ostracize her from the synagogue and from the community. And she'd have to go through mosaic rites to be able to, once she stopped bleeding, but this lady, for 12 years, that is the entire life of the young girl who just died, this lady has been bleeding and going through and been ostracized by the community in the synagogue. So she, she believes if she just touches the threads of his tassel, uh, Jewish rabbis, Jewish teachers would wear these robes and at the very uh, end of them they'd have these tassels, these threads that would be woven into a pattern that would represent their faithfulness to the word of God, that they were teachers. And most likely this is what she touched, the very threads of the tassels on the very ends of his robe. And the moment, notice uh, she's immediately clean. In other words, uh, uh, Jesus could have gotten upset because if you're touched by somebody who is unclean, that makes you unclean. But you see that Jesus was touchable even by the untouchables. And so immediately <laughs> she's healed, even before he speaks a word to her. Well, now finally he arrives at the girl's home. And let's see 
what happens here. So it says, And Jesus came to the official's house, verse 23, and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder. And he said, Leave, for the girl has not died, but is asleep. Well, they began to laugh at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. Now remember, she was dead. This news spread throughout all that land. Of course it would. So what happens here is interesting, is that when he arrives to the girl's home, there's all kinds of discord and confusion and loud noise. Uh, and, and the reason for this is because, again, according to Jewish custom, morning of death, you would do three things. There would be the tearing of garments. You would hire professional women mourners who would wail out the sorrow and help you sorrow over the grief. And then also you hired professional musicians who would play like flutes, but disconnected sounds to reflect the grief that was being expressed over the death. Well, I don't know if you pick it up here, but Jesus is a bit irritated at this because none of this was in the scriptures in the Old Testament, and he dismisses them. And according to uh, another account of this, uh, the only people to go into the room with Jesus is Peter, James, John, and the parents. And while the other ones are laughing and mocking when he says she's only asleep. And remember later on in the Gospel of John chapter 10, Jesus says the same thing about his friend Lazarus. He's not dead, he's only asleep. Meaning the body is going to be awakened. He's going to raise that body, he's going to raise him from the dead. And it's interesting, what I love just says here that he took her hand and she got up. But in another account, we're told exactly what he says. Talatha kum. And Talatha Kum was translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Well, now, after he raises this little girl, the word gets out, and immediately two blind men hit Jesus, and want to not hit him, but want to talk to him. Verse 27, and Jesus went on from there, and two blind men followed him, crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. They recognize who he is. And when he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. Why, why would Jesus keep warning that? Well, because he didn't want all of uh, Israel following him with these remarkable crowds which he would not be able to be move about. He didn't want the popularity of just the fact he can heal people, he can provide food, he can go ahead and heal sickness, um, to be the reason people would come and follow him out of curiosity or some personal desire to be able to be fed or to be healed. So he wanted to take this as a low profile. But of course, they get real excited. And uh, it's interesting, it says in verse 31, but they went out and spread the news about him throughout all the land. And they do something else I'm going to show you in, in a moment. So what goes on here is that basically, after raising a little girl, two blind men, they're begging him. Uh, uh, by the way, blindness was pervasive at the time. Because of unsanitary conditions, infectious organisms, there were no cures. But notice they referred to him as the son of David. That was a phrase used of recognition of the Messiah. So they had faith that he was indeed the Messiah. So anyway, he heals them. But notice immediately they go out and get most likely a friend of theirs who was a mute, who apparently had been their eyes uh, since they had been blind for so long. And they bring him to Jesus for healing. Verse 32, and they were going out. A mute, uh, demon-possessed, was brought to him. And after the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever happened or has been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, well, he's casting out the demons by the ruler of the demons, which is absolutely remarkable. So most likely they left and they brought their friend who was uh, could not speak. And in those days, that usually was a result of being deaf. If you could not hear, you could not speak. And Jesus goes ahead and heals him as well. Again, you see he's just reaching out reaching out to those who, who, who have a need and ask for mercy. But what's rotten here, and especially dangerous, is the Pharisees, they can't deny the miracle. So what do they do? They attribute the miracle to the devil. 
to demons. You know, later on in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus gets real serious about this, and he calls this blaspheming the Holy Spirit, a sin that cannot be forgiven in this life or the next. That is, if you attribute all the miracles of Jesus to, to Satan, to the powers of darkness, well, this is the evidence that Jesus is indeed God's Son, the Creator, who can reverse his creation and the laws of his creation. If you believe he does that by the power of the devil, then there, there's no place to go. There's no other evidence that can present and melt your heart. And so the gospel would be preached. Remember that good news is that forgiveness has been provided. If you just tell the truth and own up to your own sinfulness, there's forgiveness there. And with that forgiveness, you are then adopted as a child, a son, a daughter with a heavenly father engaged in your life and then he places his spirit within you and gives you this deep desire to honor, honor God as your father by keeping the commandments of Jesus Christ. See, the point of this whole chapter is that people's lost. People are lost. And basically, the gospel is the good news to them. Well, we'll move on in chapter 10 tomorrow. Lord willing, we'll see you then.